Today I'm going to talk about attempt mens rea. Uh, last time we looked at the basic act requirements and the difference between the model penal code approach and common law uh, regarding what constitutes attempt as opposed to mere non-criminal preparation. Uh, when we move to mens rea again we see a distinction between the common law approach and the model penal code approach um, but it may not it, in many ways it's dependent upon that act requirement distinction we dealt with last time. Uh, because common law uh, doesn't identify criminal attempt until a very late time uh, in a criminal process, uh, meaning there has to be some a situation that's dangerously close or very near the completion of a crime, it's often quite easy in common law cases to identify mens rea because uh, at that point the defendant has done everything necessary to complete the act and it's much like the analysis in a completed crime situation. Whereas the MPC, by identifying attempt at a very early stage in some cases, when there's recon or when there's a solicitation or invitation to an innocent agent, uh, mens rea can be a little cloudier because there's a problem of predicting the future. If a person is apprehended and there's uh, or intervention by uh, a third party at an early moment, uh, that can mean there's questions about what was intended, what was the exact plan uh, going forward. So uh, the mens rea issues here often build on that difference. But there's also a problem that both jurisdictions share, although it's exhibited more in our uh, model penal code case, which is a problem that we call moral luck, uh, which is in situations where a person completes all the criminal acts that, that are necessary for a completed crime, but they don't get the result, like when they shoot somebody and miss. Um, those sorts of which, situations, which I refer to as failed attempts, contrasted with incomplete attempts, present a different problem, and it's this moral luck issue. Um, so if we imagine, say, somebody who takes really reckless conduct uh, actions all the time, they're constantly going out and driving in busy pedestrian areas, they're drinking and driving, but they've managed to be lucky over and over and over again in terms of never actually injuring or killing someone. Uh, it's strange that, that we might not be able to charge them with attempted reckless homicide because of this uh, attempt and reckless seem like two very different things. Attempt implies intentionality. Recklessness doesn't. Um, and yet the one person who drunk drive once, went out and hit and killed somebody in a car, uh, they'll absorb the full penalty for the completed crime um, because there was a result and there is such a thing as reckless homicide. And this moral luck problem is, is basically that, that it, attempt and recklessness may not logically make a lot of sense. They might not go together well, but why should we reward somebody by just virtue of getting lucky that they didn't actually get the result? Um, you know, but the person who really got unlucky and even though they haven't repetitively committed reckless behavior, uh, they will get the full weight of the law. So we'll, we'll revisit the moral luck when I get to the second case. But those are the two basic dynamics here. The problem of seeing into the future and moral luck. And those extend in incomplete crimes is where we have the future problem. And then uh, failed attempts, uh, that's the moral luck problem. But let's look at some the, the common law first. Um, the common law here has a very simple rule, which is all attempted crimes are specific intent, meaning that the government has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt uh, that the defendant was not honestly mistaken as to uh, uh, the facts relevant to the crime. Now, um, this is the first moment uh, where we're going to see uh, this, this intersection between two different mens rea standards and how to resolve it. We're going to deal with it here in attempt, then in accomplice liability, then in conspiracy. In each case, what's going to happen is we have a specific rule for a completed crime, Right. And it can be any mens rea. It can be general intent. It can be specific intent. It can be a specialized rule, like in homicide where you have premeditation. And we'll get to those, right? So you'll have the, the specific crime mens rea rule. And then we have this general one that's associated with attempt or accomplice liability or conspiracy. And what happens in each of these instances is the general will override the specific, right? The spe 
because it's an attempted crime, we'll just use the attempt mens rea and ignore the underlying mens rea or overriding it is probably the better way to say it, not so much ignoring it. Um, so we'll do this mechanical sort of override process several times, but this is the first time we're addressing it, and this is true under both the common law and the NPC. And sometimes there can be issues with this, but for now, it's a pretty straightforward approach. Okay, so we have a case here um, under the common law specific intent, which is California v. Hanna. Um, this uh, is, you know, criminal law, as I say from the beginning of the semester, deals with the worst parts of humanity, right? These are things that awful people do, or maybe, you know, just we say awful, you know, horrific, immoral behavior, however we want to describe it. Um, and so, yeah, the fact pattern here, like several cases we'll look at this semester, has some pretty graphic, gruesome stuff. But it's important, you know, that we recognize what is being criminalized here. Um, but it, I, I like this fact pattern as a teaching case because it forces you to really try to separate the, the egregious, horrific conduct of our defendant from the legal rule and not allow your sort of horror or icky judgment factor you need to try and put that aside sometimes to say, well, okay, but is the law working the way it should here? And it's not clear that the court here did a great job in following that. So our fact pattern is pretty straightforward, albeit graphic, which is uh, our defendant um, has been online soliciting somebody uh, for, you know, sort of sexual interaction and a possible future meeting. It's very graphic. And the evidence seems to indicate that the person the defendant's communicating with is 13 years in age. In fact, it's, it's a father of a minor, um, and he is just pretending to be her. Uh, and so there, there's a lot of communication here, and um, you know, there's, th this creates a, a really strong evidentiary record. Now let me just, as an aside here, this, this worrisome of so-called online sex predators is actually pretty exaggerated. There's not many instances of this sort of crime in terms of where society believes they're at. But it still is a, a concern, and, and there's been a lot of criminal laws developed to deal with this specific online uh, dyna dynamic at both the federal and state level. But what, what happens here when the defendant is tried is even though there's really strong overwhelming evidence, the trial court makes a mistake. The trial court does not give the specific intent instruction as to the victim's age. Right? They just leave that aside as though it's strict liability, meaning that all that matters is, well, it's not even quite strict liability because technically the person they're speaking to is an adult. So I should say they just don't give any instruction to the jury here. And so uh, that's not right. Right? There needs to be an instruction that if the defendant was honestly mistaken, and there's a reasonable doubt to that mistake, that's all the defendant has to show is a reasonable doubt um, that they were mistaken as to the victim's age or what they perceive to be the victim's age, uh, then they should be found not guilty. Now, you might ask, well, well, how is the act requirement here even met if the person is not above age? Well, that's exactly why it is an attempt crime, right? An attempt crime means you don't have the result. Uh, so it, had it been the actual 13-year-old here, uh, we could have the completed version of the crime, which is this um, online exchange and um, corrupting of a minor, all sorts of offenses there that are completed crimes. Um, but instead, we see attempt to commit a lewd act on a 13-year-old instead of the actual commission of 13-year-old, because there is no 13-year-old, right? This is a person pretending to be a 13-year-old. But nonetheless, there needs to be a mens rea instruction, and there wasn't. Yet, the uh, court here upholds the conviction by determining that the lack of instruction was harmless error because the evidence is overwhelming uh, that uh, the defendant uh, knew the victim, you know, the perceived victim was 13 years of age. But I want to say this was probably a closer call um, than the court is saying. And once we, you know, try to remove ourselves from the horror at what our defendant's doing here, there is at least one piece of evidence that indicates uh, the defendant might have thought uh, our victim was, uh, or perceived victim, uh, was, was 18, which is her profile page on MySpace, said 18. Now, the interactions do seem to, to indicate, well, you know, he, he was given many contrary pieces of evidence, and, and in fact, they discussed whether the profile page was honest. And truthfully, he seems to be pursuing an underage victim here. And so, yeah, I think the, the, the large majority of the evidence here favors the prosecution and not the defense.
But since the instruction wasn't given, we don't know for sure. So there's a pretty decent argument here that this should be reversed and retried, right? Just so the jurors get to hear the same evidence, hear the proper instruction, and decide whether or not the piece of evidence the defendant is citing here, her profile page indicating the age of eight, 18, is sufficient to raise a reasonable doubt. I don't think it necessarily will, but the appellate court, you know, maybe should let it go to retrial. But it's a closer call. So either way, this is a... a basic case to outline specific intents of the rule, and then we can think about how it should be applied here. The court applies it in a way that they think there's no honest mistake. There's Even subjectively, it would be crazy to think this defendant was honestly mistaken as to the perceived victim's age. Uh, but, you know, it, it, you could say there's a reasonable doubt here, or at least jurors should be allowed to look at it. Okay, so that's our common law approach. Pretty straightforward. The model penal code approach here, embodied in this slide, is, for the most part, Purpose is our rule. So our very high standard for mens rea, meaning that it has to be a conscious object of our defendant to commit uh, the result of the crime and the conduct of the crime. But then you'll notice I have this little box here of knowledge. This is why I went through that, that sort of walkthrough at the beginning of our mens rea model penal code section, where I said there's the conduct elements, circumstance elements, and result elements. Well, it turns out for... Um, circumstances elements, things like is it occurring at night, is the victim a police officer, things like that. Um, there's sort of a modified knowledge standard. It's not a pure knowledge standard. It does have this concept of practical certainty involved in it, but it's actually the circumstances as the defendant believes them to be. In other words, their realm of knowledge rarely comes up, rarely is an issue. But if the attempt crime has a question as to the, where the defendant seems confused about a circumstance element that I gave examples of and we, we walked through it before, then you'd want to apply knowledge. But over, most of the time, you're just going to be applying purpose. So purpose is the standard with a little bit of knowledge is, is basically the best way to simply articulate it. Okay, so Nebraska v. Hemmer gives us an example to um, look at this moral luck problem that I outlined at the beginning. Because here we have a defendant who seems to be acting recklessly, and they're acting recklessly in a way that endangers the police officer uh, who, you know, they're trying to stop in the, the, the defendant in our high-speed chase. And uh, this case, the sheriff attempted to flag Hemmer's vehicle down as it approached, but when Hemmer's vehicle did not stop, the sheriff was forced to dive into a snowbank. It turns out, because it was a snowy day and the snowbank was up, he was uninjured. So the government has charged our defendant here uh, with attempted reckless assault of an officer in the second degree. And you see the statute here um, for attempt, uh, which follows the MPC approach. And then you see the statute in the text that's for assault. And so the mens rea for um, attempt, as I said, should override um, the mens rea for assault, which is recklessness. But what does that mean? That means it would have to be the defendant's purpose. Right? In other words, if the attempt standard controls here, then you can't have a recklessness mens rea for the crime. And this is ultimately, I mean, the court here is probably a little more long-winded and, and engages the um, uh, model penal code drafter commentaries, which aren't binding but are sometimes helpful, to explain this result. But it basically boils down to that. We use the attempt standard, which is purpose. It overrides the substantive crime of recklessness. And there's no way the defendant here, it purpose, there's no evidence he purposely, consciously object, tried to kill an officer. I shouldn't say there's no evidence. There's not evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. And so this is the majority approach with the model penal code, and it follows what the drafters intended. But you'll notice in the, the paragraph that begins on 167 and goes all the way to 168, at the very bottom there of this string site, you know, a series of cases cited, there's this but see people versus Thomas in Colorado and Gentry versus State in Florida. Well, this is saying, you know, your new law students you might not pick up on. But what this is saying is, is two jurisdictions have come out differently on this issue. The majority have followed the Nebraska v. Hammer approach, which says you can't have purposeful recklessness. That just doesn't make any sense. So you can't have attempted recklessness. That's insane. Why do these other jurisdictions come out the other way? Well, it's because of this moral luck concern, right? In other words, why should our defendant be rewarded because there happened to be a snowbank nearby that the police officer could safely land in and avoid injury, right? If we imagine there was a hundred fact patterns identical to this, 
And in 5% of them, the police officer um, would not be able to land in a snowbank or some other safe location. Well, those 5% of defendants would then face the completed crime of reckless assault on an officer, which carries serious penalties. And the other 95%, no one, I mean, there's, there's no crime of this magnitude uh, which the defendant is guilty of. And so these, these sort of dis, uh, minority rule jurisdictions here say, well, why, why, just, why are we focusing on this 5% and excusing the 95% when they both engaged in the same sort of dangerous behavior? And so they allow, for pragmatic reasons, for, for the moral luck problem, allow attempted recklessness. And, and as I said, conceptually, that doesn't make a lot of sense, and it doesn't seem to follow rules. But it's, it is a minority rule that some jurisdictions have. And even though we look at an MPC case here, uh, the same basic problem occurs in the common law, right? Instead of using purpose as our mens rea here, let's imagine we had specific intent, right? Let's say, well, could our defendant say I was honestly mistaken and I didn't mean to, um, you know, I wasn't my goal. It wasn't my honest intention to uh, assault the police officer here. I was just trying to escape. Yeah. And so most common law jurisdictions say, yeah, for you can't specific intent, recklessness, they don't interact, right? Because one excuses honest mistakes and the other one doesn't. So those two standards, you know, are, are at odds with each other. But again, there's a minority of common law jurisdictions because of the moral lack problem that say, why not? Let's have attempted recklessness. And that sort of abandons the specific intent rule. So I do want to highlight the existence of the minority rules, but we want to focus mostly on the way uh, the majorities uh, do it here, which is uh, in terms of the moral luck, it's that's just the, the luck is integrated into our legal system. So you get rewarded by the fact that your reckless conduct did not cause the result that it might have caused on another day in other circumstances or if the snowbank wasn't there. So you'll notice I've gone through mens rea here for attempt relatively quickly because it's not that complicated in most of our cases. It turns out this is an area where the act requirements often a little more difficult and require a little more intricate analysis. Whereas the mens rea is just another application of a specific intent rule that you've already learned and purpose with a little bit of knowledge that you've already learned. Uh, so this won't be true in every chapter. Sometimes, most of the time, the mens rea is really where things get trickier. But with attempt, it's a little bit easier. So that's it for today. Next time, we'll be looking at some specific affirmative defenses uh, to inchoate crimes like attempt.